Hello and welcome to Citizens ABC Finnish Garden series. We are a fast-growing YouTube podcast uh, that profiles and highlights global leaders, CEOs, and people changing the narrative. And as we're all doing things in terms of technology, software development, and solutions for our cities and our countries, and as well for all of us citizens. In our project, and as well in the series of podcasts, which right now we have 70 people, we've been actually interviewing from ministers to high-profile CEOs, and as well thought leaders that are changing the way we think and the way we act, and as well looking at areas like big data, cybersecurity, how countries can look at blockchain, artificial intelligence, fintech, IoT, and a lot of other terminologies around emerging technologies and the so-called fourth industrial revolution. Uh, we passed as well the, the benchmark of 2.1 million views in the last that we only started actually four months ago or three. So we're quite proud about it. So we want to take this to the next level. And then of course the platform behind this is citiesabc.com. That is a platform for cities, for citizens, and as well a bit of a terminal that can actually create more data and more profiling for the data around the cities and nations. And as well of course the platform open business council, a week for AR, for business and for personalities. And of course, we distribute this content through IntelligentHQ.com, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, and a lot of other platforms around the world. Today, I'm glad and honored to have today with us uh, Micah Walker, the CEO uh, of uh, Grava.com and Grava uh, Technologies, which is a platform that has been working in some of the biggest challenges when it comes to technology, identity, and biometrics. Micah has a, plat has a, a, a big a profile in terms of uh, managing big companies. And he has a previously wor been working with different industries, but in the last years have been coming to Grava as the CEO to redesign and take the company to a new level. Grava is definitely one of the cutting edge companies that is looking at some of the most sensitive and as well most important things that we deal on a daily basis. From biometric code to barcodes and a lot of technology solutions that are important for our day to day. And as well looking at solutions and as what we're looking at uh, expanding our identity. Micah, Micah uh, Walker has the fortunate experience of leading a very diverse group of organizations through their journey in scaling for growth. And uh, some of them has been working in Middle East, Asia, Australia, in project management across many other global markets. And with uh, Grava, is looking at the challenge related with identity and the areas of cyber related identity and solutions. Welcome, Micah, to this platform. Good to have you here, Micah. Great introduction. I'm very humbled by that and honored to be here with you. As an Australian based right now in Dubai and Middle East and as well working in a lot of different industry sectors, so from, from retail and the coffee house to fashion and right now in, in very advanced technologies. So can you tell us a bit about that background and as well from a cultural perspective, of course, Australia is very different from Middle East, but as well, this, sure all is. these different backgrounds Ground, a bit of your background and how do you came to become the CEO of Grabber? Look, over the last couple of decades, I've had the honor to be a part of some very diverse portfolios of products. So from, like you said, coffee to fashion, uh, to, to fine jewelry, and now on to uh, high growth technology. Um, as, a, as a scale up CEO now, we have the opportunity to, to really change the game and change an industry. And I saw that happen in, in fashion retail as well as in fine jewellery and as well on my origins in, in a global hospitality organisation through the change of people's palate and uh, technology has come uh, a long way. And if you're not, one, one thing I asked myself when I moved from those industries to, to my next venture is, uh, you know, how, what is the investment in technology and how is the industry and the organisations that I was uh, touching, how are they investing in technology? And you know, to, to sort of put it bluntly, if you weren't investing in technology and if you weren't already transforming or transformed uh, pre-COVID, then you're certainly being found out right now. So um, I'm definitely very excited to be in a, in a realm that, um, that I'm very passionate about. And, you know, instead of the digital transformation occurring within the organizations that I'm uh, working within, I now have the, um, the, the honor and the prestige to be the CEO of a, a transforming organization uh, and a digital one. And someone 
um, someone that, that really believes in, in people. Uh, I have connected with people from more than 35 countries that I've been uh, had the honor of working in. And so being able to connect with different people from different walks of life, I find, Denise, that people want the same thing. They want to be able to trust you in that interaction, uh, whether it's a business transaction or a purchase or a, a franchise agreement uh, or, or a large-scale technology choice. They want to be able to trust the person across the table. And so that took my family and I, my four children and my wife, uh, over to Dubai. I had been traveling extensively, and most of the customers that we had been serving had been based either in this region or within uh, touching distance from this region. So uh, Dubai, United Arab Emirates, is a very fast-thinking and forward-thinking um, uh, uh, country. And the UAE's vision for the future is extremely large and ambitious. So it really is the right place for uh, any ambitious CEO to be based, especially um, those who have a technology bent. I think you, you, what is interesting about Grab is definitely a company, like you mentioned, with 20 years, but as well working cutting-edge solutions. So before we go totally to your cutting-edge solutions, and you have a lot, can you tell us about this, Ree? Because it's quite interesting, a company with 20 years that keeps uh, renovating, and ultimately this is 20 years, more or less, the time of the internet history. So a lot of things changed since then. The, the original grabber that came about uh, that was highly innovative at the time was was made out of aluminium or aluminum, depending on the part of the planet that you're watching this video right now. And it was a one technology device. It was a 1D barcode scanner. Now to move that 1D barcode scanner to, to, to double dimensional uh, and then into QR codes and three dimensional was a five year project. And so 15 years beyond that, we, we now integrate more than 20 different technology mo modules for everything from fingerprint capture to iris, facial recognition, uh, right over to documents like passports and smart card readers uh, and more traditional forms of identity. And so you do have to keep reimagining, you have to keep adapting. And uh, the company has been in its current form owned uh, over the last four years and has been skyrocketing through growth in internationally. Um, and what was a, an extremely innovative engineering firm has become a, a sort of a standout scale up that's now reaching a lot of law enforcement agencies, telecommunications retailers, banks, and also travel organizations pre-COVID as well. When it comes to the areas that you're touching, this is the most sensitive areas on history of mankind. And as well, this is making a big uh, shift in our society. So in one end, you're dealing with massive amounts of data, but as well, very sensitive data. So how do you deal with these sensitivities? And as well, I think let's go through some of the things. And before I go to this part of the sensitivities, you're working with the technology like biometric technologies, um, fingerprint capture, iris recognition, facial recognition, passport reader, contact smart card, and a lot of other things like barcode, uh, machine readable mm -hmm. zones and so forth. So can you tell us a bit mm -hmm. about these different offers? And then I want to touch the way you, del you deal with data. I mean, you have three very distinct groups of perspectives. You have countries and cities, and they want safer travel and more secured living conditions for the citizens and the residents of their, of their areas. You have then organizations, be it quasi-government or be it fully commercial, and they want loyalty. They want loyalty over a lifetime. Everybody's trying to, to gain their part of the market share. So um, they, want, they want loyalty and ease and efficiency of use in interacting with their products and services. And then you have us. We are, you know, we always say instead of B2B or B2G, we're a P2B, P. We're a people-to-people -people organization. We, we, we simply have the benefit and the honor of dealing with governments, of, with organizations and with end users. And so that's why you won't hear me refer to the end user of the grabber. Um, we deal with law enforcement officers. We deal with uh, travel onboarding specialists, with cruise operators. We deal with um, border security agents in many, many countries in Europe, Asia, and in North America, we deal with law enforcement protecting borders. And here in the UAE, we deal with mobile banking and telecommunications, verifying people's identity before they make a purchase. Some of those purchases are highly sensitive. And so when you talk about, as you did, about how do we handle that sensitivity, obviously the technology needs to be rock solid, but the people that have uh, coded the algorithms and the people that have handled the customer interaction also need to have the, the greatest of integrity and we wouldn't have achieved the government level certification here in the UAE as a government identity provider if we did not meet all of those privacy and integrity measures so it's something that we pride ourselves upon just to understand and for the people listening to us of course not everyone is so technology um, expert as you so can you tell us a bit about uh, biometric technologies and some of the solutions that you have because i think this is something that we all deal with this from our phones um, to our 
just going to an airport, which right now, unfortunately, is becoming a bit uh, this year, a bit awkward. But uh, how do you deal with these things, which is part of our daily lives, but most of people don't understand. So let's look at biometric technology to start. When I got into this industry, one of the first questions I had was an internal rhetorical question around, am I doing good here? You know, is this doing, doing well for the world or, or are we doing evil? And, you know, when I could answer that question, it was, it was game on. These technologies have been around for quite some time. Biometrics has been around for, for many more decades than people realize. The easiest way to help people get a handle of it uh, and to, to meet the education and technology innovation into a, into a bridge, which we uh, believe in at Grabber, is that there's something you have, which is a card or a document. And that's usually been issued by a sovereign entity, either a government or a state, uh, in the case of a, license, a driver's license in Australia, you know, or, or a bank issuing you a card. So that's something you have and you have it on your person to identify yourself, to gain access to your bank account or to gain access to travel. Then there's something you know, there's a secret PIN, there's a one-time password, there's a special code that you have gained access to as a secondary, a second factor of authentication. Um, but then there's something that cannot be, uh, it's beyond reproach and it's who you are, who you are in the very DNA of your fingerprint, your iris, your face, uh, people are researching palm ID, lots and lots of competitors and lots of uh, really great innovators out there at the moment are researching the merits of those different technologies. And what they essentially do is without disturbing our, uh, our, our, our pri the privacy of who we are, it actually uses the exact specification of a one-to-one -one match. So I'm looking for Denise and I see that he has a smart card. So I'm going to use that smart card, which is something he has. Um, and instead of using the pin, which he may forget or can be mimicked or can be can be stolen, if you will, can be fraudulently obtained, I'm going to then use his face or his fingerprint in some cases. And by unlocking his personal details with his fingerprint, which only he can hold his fingerprints, and there is a level of sophistication to many, many software providers out there, uh, not only Grabber, that can, you know, anti-spoofing, we call it, um, that can give real credibility and trust to this. This means that Denise can, can perform a transaction, a sensitive transaction. It could be obtaining a SIM card. It could be paying for a purchase, it could be obtaining a visa to a foreign country. And all of these things can be done from the comfort of your own phone, Denise. So hopefully this helps uh, impact people's understanding of um, the what you have, what you know, and the who you are. And so biometrics is simply the measurement of our biology through either fingerprint, iris, face, or other techniques that haven't been yet uh, found. But you will find in many countries that there is a database uh, for some residents of UAE. They will know that when you go and purchase a SIM card, you must present your fingerprint. That must match the fingerprint that was taken when you became a resident of the country, when you were authorized uh, entry into the country. And you could use that. You can use your fingerprint without any breach of privacy or security under very, very strict security and privacy guidelines. You can use that to unlock services, uh, to conduct transactions, to move money to your home country, to permit your uh, family members to travel. So we certainly believe that that's uh, for the betterment of the world and uh, that our role to play is in creating that bridge between the larger organizations that want these, uh, that, that have these goals and perspectives, and then the citizen who wants something easy and secure to use. You work with a lot of governments, like you mentioned, but this is something that is very present in our daily lives. Um, so from a technology perspective and from a, a business perspective, how do you handle between, for instance, the, let's say right now we've been having a lot of uh, things related with the, uh, for instance, countries that are very prepared for this and countries that are not prepared at all. How do you deal with these people-to-people uh, -people operations when you start relationships with these governments and these organizations? Well, I think the key is to listen. The key to, to being a trusted authority in anything is to first listen. Um, you know, to, to somebody once said, you know, to, to first to seek to understand is to, is to be the first goal and we must listen in order to understand the other person's uh, perceptions and background and goals. And so we, we take great care and integrity in the conversations that we have with very high level and very sensitive customers. So we're talking about very large scale global telecommunications companies, banks, government organizations, border security, law enforcement agencies that handle very, very sensitive data. And we take great care in understanding what are their needs? And what, are, what are they sensitive to? So we augment um, you know, I often think of AI instead of artificial intelligence. We're in this realm where it's augmented intelligence. It's taking the intelligence we have and that we know and, and, and bringing about some change through biometrics. So if we can prove that uh, 
somebody is who they say they are, then they may not have to wait in a waiting area to be identified. You know those stressful situations that we all go through when waiting in line, and it's not just in a bank, it could be in, a, in an airport line, as you mentioned before, it could be upon entry into a country. Um, these, are, these are somewhat stressful situations and to, to provide people with smooth, easy access uh, and the knowledge that they, yes, they do have permission to enter this country or this bank or this product, um, or be given access to this service. This is something that keeps people at ease. I mean, customer demand is moving faster than ever. Seamlessly, mobile phone app applications are, you know, landing themselves in our pockets. Uh, I just did the latest iOS update, and now all of a sudden, 250 apps want to to update all of their information on my device. So the world is screaming uh, ahead towards digital innovation and. The, the consumer-centric or the citizen-centric, as, as I like to say, model of making sure people have empowered usage of their identity is where we play best. Given the nature and the sensitivity of the data that you're managing and as well all the operations passing through your technology. So point one is about cybersecurity, which I think is probably the biggest question that people have. So how do you deal with cybersecurity? Let's look at that detail. So first of all, our company has various certifications. So everything from ISO 27001 uh, to the environmental and sustainable uh, sustainability certifications to aerospace 9100 through our manufacturing division. These are some of the highest levels of security clearance and, and information management systems come along with that. So being a certified information management company means that we've had to go through the hoops. We've had to jump through the hoops. Now, then when you're sitting in front of somebody, you, you Denise, you have to look them in the eye. And I, I don't think when we're talking to a customer about when we're talking to an organization about handling sensitive data, we, we really even touch on that. What we touch on is how the technology works and how the, uh, for example, with our software, how the architecture of the token moving from one website to a mobile phone back to a website, allowing Denise to open up a bank account, how that works seamlessly and is protected within a framework of the Identity and Citizenship Authority here in the UAE and the particular banks that we deal with. This is an end-to-end -end seamless transaction that happens within secured environments. So to give people a, a sort of an understanding of this, it, it, it's like sort of going into a, a building where there are um, various security guards and law enforcement officials and being able to have a conversation privately. Um, there are already security protocols that wrap themselves around this. And as we know from the, the probably threat actors and bad things that happen in the world, um, cybersecurity is an issue and security in general is an issue. Breaches will, will eventually become something that we have to minimise. However, we integrate ourselves into the systems that already exist within the organisation. There are also various other experts, Denise. So this is a collaboration. This is just not uh, Grabber's area of thought leadership. We have deployment and trust with so many organizations, but that hasn't happened alone. We use some of the world's best modular technologies. And one of the modules and several of the modules you can tap into out there are specific to security. And so they don't do biometric validation. They don't do identity card reading. They just do the secured layer on top. And so um, for people that are understanding this for the first time, they should understand that there are some subject matter experts, you know, no different to when social media was brand new or when Internet 2.0 came out and we all didn't know what was called Internet 2.0. Apparently, there's something called 3.0 around the corner, you know, networking and staying on one, one website and, and spending your whole afternoon just on one platform is something that didn't exist 20 years ago when Grabber was born. So we're all going through all of these changes. And as we educate ourselves more about what to do and what the right and wrong things are to do, um, the technology doors will open and it will create a bridge to the future that we want to have and live in, which is a faster, more seamless way to do things and more securely. So we, we obviously root ourselves in this integrity-based uh, model of protecting people's information and largely to a degree, Denise, we don't actually have a, a copy of any of that information. It's transformation of the information from physical to digital. So we intentionally don't keep copies of people's data uh, in any way, shape or form. Even a record of that transaction is only held inside of the sovereign issued identity authority within the government. And that's how we handle the privacy element. Touching as well this area of the, the data. Okay, so and the, given that you guys are touching the most sensitive data, so in, in terms of pure management of data, so for instance, because you have quite a lot of verticals that we're working from governments to um, enforcement agencies to even education and big corporations that we are collaborating. So how do you, and I think this is for 
of course, I'm not going to the sensitive part, but just to understand, let's say for someone that is outside, and I think for instance, one of the challenges we have is that everyone has an opinion about things, uh, mm-hmm. but the opinions tend to become very geopolitical and sometimes very with a lack of understanding of the basics. Could you tell us just, and you explain, for instance, the cybersecurity, but on the data part, because I think you just, like you just said, Mm -hmm. you're not touching the data. And I think this is very important because let's say that we have a lot of these theories of conspiracy from right now that, uh, uh, I don't know, 5G is is created by some kind of paranoia and all this craziness. And I think it's really important to demystify. So I would like to hear from your expertise as well, because I think, yeah. The best way we can actually improve the world is demystify and teach people, but as well to look at right. facts. Yeah. So if you could yeah. uh, talk a bit about that. Yeah. And I think one, one of the things to understand when you start to get into the realm of expertise is to first understand how much you, you aren't aware of and how much we all have to learn. So I think we, we start from a beginner's mindset when it comes to, to data. The organizations that we work with that are validating somebody's identity, they also don't keep and are are not permitted by law to keep a capture of that person's fingerprint or face or iris in that case. What we do is we capture the data and we capture it um, in a secured token and we send it off to, to be authenticated and we say validated. So is that person's identity document correct? And is the biometric data, if so, that relates to that uh, to, to that person's document is, is that in fact from that same person um, that then sends back an approval to, to proceed with the service or the product. And so if you compare this Denise to taking a photo of someone's driver's license, for example, you go in, you want to open up a bank account and the banking employee pulls out a mobile phone, tech savvy, takes a photo of my driver's license or my Emirates identity card or my Australian passport. I, I would have a sincere issue with that person taking a photo of that document because are they going to delete it from their phone? Where does that go? Is it going to be emailed? Emails we know from phishing and cyber threats can actually be obtained. Any identity documents that are carried out over an email um, is less secure than a two-factor access um, one-to-one relationship over the cloud. So what we create is a one-to-one relationship between um, the phone or the grabber device and then the identity and citizenship authority um, in the case of the UAE here. And it's the same Uh, in North America and in Eastern Europe and in the UK where we work with law enforcement agencies, they have very secure access on the mobile phones that they use in order to to conduct an identity transaction. When you are pulled up for an identity check, when you are moving into a concert or through a a transport gate through a border, your details are captured and stored in the identity and citizenship um, realm for the purpose of moving you from one place to another. And each sovereign country has their own legislation and has their own guidelines, Denise, for how how this can be managed. We think we remain uh, outside of that topic of uh, sort of, it becomes how questionable is this? We we feel that we remain um, uh, cleansed of that because we don't keep any copies or any parts uh, or any receipts or any records of that. That transaction is simply, we are simply integrating the world's best technology so that the throughput is that that person can get to where they need to go. In saying this, we become quite an expert and quite the expertise that you speak of is that we sort of, we know how to do it. There are other companies, uh, not Grabber, there are other companies that would seek to create an identity, that would seek to monetize that identity. And that's just not what we do. We, we like to work within the sovereign issued, sovereign issued identity. We believe that when a, a democratic sovereign issued identity is issued to a person, that that trust has been created from the government and from the citizen. What we seek to do is we seek to have that citizen empowered and enabled to transact through life easier and more securely. Because if someone's taking a picture of my documents, which has happened to me in the past, are they storing it? Are they keeping it? Um, we can't be sure. And we shouldn't think the worst of everything or everybody, but in the transactions that Grabber performs, uh, we are 100% certain that uh, the match has been created and the records have not been kept on either the phone or the employee's device. Bearing in mind that you're touching biometric data and a lot of uh, cybersecurity, high profile data, like you just mentioned, are you right now looking at blockchain technology or artificial intelligence in terms of your devices and the coordination with machine learning and different areas? Yes, definitely we are. I think um, I recently completed a postgraduate uh, program on uh, the the cases of artificial intelligence and how we can apply them in today's world. And there's a lot of new innovations that are coming up and there's new languages and GPT-3 is a recent 
addition to a set of languages that are coming out that are going to, uh, you know, radically allow changes to happen in, in artificial intelligence. I think the machine learning um, aspects of, of AI are going to be uh, able to be understood by many and most people in the sense that you're taking intelligence that's already there. So you're not creating some new understanding of something, but you're taking a bias or a, an assumption of something and you're turning it into something else. This particularly works well when it comes to facial recognition. You mentioned this was a, uh, a technical question. And so this is the sort of the, the best subpar technical answer I can give you is that you're looking for geometry to match this person's face against the face that's in the records um, that's related to Denise. And what we know from fingerprint and iris is that it's a highly accurate, more uh, more entry-level cost initiative to go in and do a one-to-one -one match. Is this his fingerprint or not? With face, there are some changes. There are some appearance changes that will happen from us. There's also lighting. And so there's a certain um, sense of, I don't want to say guessing because it's the wrong thing, but there's a certain sense of predictability. We can predict that this is Micah's face or Denise's face to a certain level of accuracy. With other forms of biometrics, you can predict it to a higher level of uh, predictability and accuracy. And this is why very, very large governments such as North American governments have used fingerprints for the last 25 years. And they have the largest, the largest databases of, you know, both DNA fingerprints and, and now coming online is, is face. And um, I think we all, we all don't want our face or, or our appearance to be used um, for ulterior uh, motives. But I think in the sense of what we talked about just before, Denise, about protecting somebody's um, citizenship, I think it's in the best interest of most government sovereign bodies to protect the identity of their citizens because without the trust that occurs between those two parties, um, we, we don't have a lot. And you, you see dissent and you see, um, you see disunity and distrust. Um, but there is generational change afoot. There is uh, a new crowd and there's millennials and there'll be a generation after them that don't even understand what we're talking about. You know, things like blockchain um, that secure a a person-to-person -person transaction, whether that be data or whether that be a financial transaction. I think these are the things that we could go into a great debate about and there are experts um, far more learned than I. However, we are seeing great opportunities with things like stable coin and offering people the opportunity to send money from one country to another. So repatriating funds is a really important part of international uh, monetary policy and uh, protecting uh, banks, financial institutions and people like you and I from fraud and from corruption in, inside of that um, digital financial economy is very, very important to large organisations, to governments, and obviously to the people sending the money home. So we see blockchain helping to create a safer and more secure, perhaps even more cost-effective link uh, for people to be able to move currencies around and that it shouldn't be feared, Denise. Uh, there, is, there is some warranted appeal to the PR and the bad press around some of these things. But like anything, uh, when everybody gets along and after those few pioneers have created a movement, um, regulations will come and taxes will need to be paid. However, people will, will understand over time that blockchain isn't simply about a cryptocurrency or about a, a, a distrusting way of doing business. It's, it's actually about a more trusting, uh, decentralized way of doing uh, of conducting a transaction. And so we, we certainly do see that the that blockchain technologies will bring more trust and potentially more transparency and along with what Grabber brings, uh, more accuracy to the transaction. Because we know through blockchain that, you know, that the ledger will show that you did in fact transact with me for a product or a service or a financial transaction, but how am I to know that you're the person on the other end of the mobile phone? This is where identity validation becomes the key to closing the loop to a 100% score uh, between blockchain identity validation um, and some of the other technologies we're going to talk about and that you talk about on your channel. Um, these, in fact, are our future, whether we like it or not. Yeah, and then it's going to be more and more increasing, more important because you, you like you said, this is just the beginning of that. When you touch with accessibility and as well with the strategy about working in the areas that you do, there's three areas that are key. One, of course, is all the, the accessibility, accessibility of data and that you mentioned and you're talking of where you own this data, where you manage this data. The second, of course, is the, the, the cybersecurity. And of course, the third one is the ethics uh, around this, but as well, what can be done with this data? And there's a lot of things that uh, some governments are already moving forward, but most of the governments are not. So how do you deal with this kind of three layers and from the technology that you're creating to the management of data, which is a separate thing, are you working as well or do you are more separating that part? 
Great question. And I think the first thing you have to do, and you know, whether or not this was my culture and in, in being an Australian or whether other cultures share this too, you, you've got to get your own backyard in, in order. So I was just talking to my leadership team this morning about uh, ethics and values and, and our mission and vision and how important that is to, to recall um, at, a, at a minute's notice. At the moment, the, the way that things are evolving, Denise, yes, we are being approached by and uh, partnering with um, compliance agencies and other software as a service agencies that provide an extremely important and valuable service to financial institutions, to governments, and they need the area of uh, identity validation that we that we look after. So in, in a sense, this collaboration between subject experts, so whether it's a, a regulation technology firm that only deals in compliance auditing, uh, an identity validation group such as Grabber that can integrate both sides of the fence, uh, and then there are there are the matters of KYC, which is uh, know your customer. And electronic means of doing that is to both ask compliance related questions around somebody's status, and maybe they have a particular credit score, and linking that up with their identity to to form a picture of who someone is is not the the vision and mission of our company, but it is the important work of a financial institution on whether they should in fact loan uh, or, or in fact borrow money uh, on that person's behalf. So when we, when we sort of link with these organisations, it's important that we have a values connect and an alignment. So certain whether that's a country, whether that's a compliance uh, technology firm, uh, whether that's a fellow identity validation firm, we must first make sure that the, the, the values are clear between us. Uh, because if there's a mismatch, we we would want no no part of of that relationship. This is a this is a multi trillion dollar uh, industry in terms of you know enabling people to live a mobile and digitized world. And identity validation is only a small part of that, but a small part of uh, trillions is is billions. So you know we're honoured to have earned people's trust over the last couple of decades, and we have a lot of plans for the next decade to. Bring, a, bring about a, a new set of innovative challenge, um, challenge bending, challenge solving um, products. And, you know, we're in the midst of a crisis that only, it only asserts that these, um, that these changes need to be made. It, it's, it's a very unfortunate and tragic circumstance for many countries and many families out in the world today. And it, it only highlights the need to be digitally ready and to be transforming continuously. Uh, as we move into the 20s and the 30s and beyond. Because at the moment, you're dealing with a lot of countries and all these organizations, but the problem is that there's a lack of education. We touched this partly, but I would like to understand from your experience with 20 years, dealing with a lot of different sectors before being CEO of Grava, but as well Mm -hmm. now you're dealing with a huge component of, like you said, people to people, but as well nations, cities, uh, organizations dealing with a lot of things. So how do you see the part of digital transformation 360 and how you deal with that, uh, bearing in mind that you you have the most advanced part of the the part of the spectrum of technology that we are touching? I think that one of the most important skills that we can carry into into our careers now, whether you're uh, in in an identity firm like mine or whether you're working for a financial institution or whether you're an admin officer in a government agency, is we need to be adaptable. We need to have that AQ. Um, you know, initially we learned about intelligence and, and how IQ would shape our decisions. We also then learned about EQ and how knowing um, knowing how we feel and knowing how to interact with others was an extremely important soft skill to to blend with EQ. And now there so happens to be a multiplier. And I firmly believe that it's intelligence plus emotional um, with a with a, a denominator of adaptability. Um, this adaptability equation is so vital. And so governments that uh, are willing to look at smart firms, smart cities. I believe there's terms out there. I think there should be some new terms. You know, there should be, you know, augmented intelligence before artificial intelligence. I don't want anyone artificially telling me who I am. Uh, I want somebody to augment the data that's already there to confirm that my children can go to this country or um, can perform that transaction in their future. I want them to own their own identity. And this this form of citizen-centric identity, Denise, and this um, empowerment concept is, is, is not too far-fetching in this world. We have now seen uh, presentations that we made 12 months ago where we talked about citizen-owned, citizen-enabled identity, um, the sovereign individual, if you will, somebody that's issued a passport or a document and biometrics may be captured at that point um, and then is given the trust, so the government is then giving that person the trust that they may travel just on the basis of who they are 
on the basis of showing their face, on the basis of showing their fingerprint. If they have nothing to hide, then the country has nothing to hide. And we can give these people permission um, very easily using our, our software. But trusted technology is the key. Technology is always going to be there. Um, you know, a pen and a, a, a piece of paper and a pen, uh, it was a techno technological innovation at one stage in our, uh, in our past. Um, via candlelight, people were transmitting messages to each other. We now can do this from the touch of our smart device. And in fact, we can open up a bank account, uh, not just from a NEO account, but from a traditional bank um, and we can also transfer funds using stablecoin uh, crypto right now in, in today's age. So the technology that's on our fingertips today will, will actually be adopted quite quickly tomorrow. Um, I, the AI of today that we speak of will just be normal, um, normal GoFi tomorrow, normal good old fashioned um, common sense technology. So we'll all be using it for the next several decades. And I, for one, am excited. I'm excited because uh, Grab is a part of the positivity in that and the optimistic future that says that people should have a safe, uh, a safe version of their identity. You know, the, the UN has a special council to provide identity to, to, to all people on earth by 2030. They have a special division associated with it. Sadly, more than 2 billion people do not have a verifiable form of identity, which makes things like uh, food, security, healthcare, and um, the, the right to vote uh, an extremely hard thing. Now, these are for, and I don't want to speak for you, but these are rights uh, that we may take for granted in uh, developed nations. And these are things that we have our ways to go. Um, but I think the more that smart cities, and I know your channel talks a lot about cities and the, the development of digital economies, the faster that we can get this um, trusted technology into people's hands, the better. But the key is the trust. It's all about the trusted technologies. Yeah, and I think that is the key the key element actually for the next decade, especially as AI and, and blockchain become so advanced that, uh, let's say, if you look at Chinese government, is already too advanced, while well, the rest of the governments uh, actually are not at the same level. So... Uh, it's been a pleasure. I, I want to wrap up with one of last question that is, uh, and you are very optimistic, which I like, especially bear in mind the, the sensitivity and as well the the cutting edge uh, solutions that you you and your company are building. So in terms of, uh, so 2020 has been a completely um, disruptive year for a lot of things. Uh, and I think especially COVID-19 has been creating a, a massive uh, challenge, probably the biggest in the last 200 years. Because even during the Second World War and the First World War, people could actually move from one place to the other. Now we are going through a lot of uh, um, well, a lot of issues that are coming out of COVID nineteen. But this is as well, if you look at the positive side, it's creating a huge amount of uh, acceleration of digital transformation and a lot of things you mentioned. Because for instance, effectively, there's we have eight billion people in the world, and let's say two to three billion don't even have like basic financial identification or even identification at all, like you just mentioned. So how do you see COVID-19 and as well, um, is this creating a lot of solutions, uh, both I'm sure for your company that probably much more work because this will create a lot of new things. But at the same time, how do you see this uh, from your experience and as well dealing with a lot of cities, like you mentioned, from smart cities to cities to countries, because this is going to be increasingly more important going forward. And, you know, just, just to get the, the crystal ball out, this isn't the first global crisis that the world ha has foreseen. It's certainly the one we're dealing with now. And it's, it's undoubtedly the, the end of an incredibly long run of global economic growth, um, where globalization was, you know, a term that wasn't even coined 30 years ago. So um, with, with the growth and the economic freedom that the world has had, um, now being stunted and, and declining, there is undoubtedly a forced um, innovation and a forced transformation for some countries. But in other countries and, and cities and throughout parts of the world, there is leadership that exists. And there are people that have been saying, hey, we need to do this. We need to look at incubating these technologies. And you mentioned acceleration. So there's an acceleration pretty much of whatever you had. I'm, I'm drawn to, the, I'm drawn to the old, that old saying about, um, you know, character isn't, um, isn't built during adversity, but it's revealed during adversity. And I think if your firm or your country or your government and the leaders that are around you, even in the family sense, as a, um, as a father, which is very important to me, you know, the leadership and the character that you carry into today will be the, what you rely on tomorrow. So some of, these, um, some of my answer to this, what will we do and how will we emerge from this is that we are already doing it today, this interview, this conversation right now. We are creating a future that we want to live in. And that future is that people will be empowered by the identity uh, that they own, that they've been issued by a sovereign, uh, sovereign government. 
um, democratically. And that person should then have the freedom, we believe, to be able to travel, to be able to do things that they are permitted to do. Um, technology can allow it. If people's mindsets can be open to the learning and if privacy and security uh, can be innovated in such a way that it can protect me and that I can understand how this is protecting me, then this is how we will emerge. And it won't just be contact tracing and Bluetooth and uh, making sure that you know who, you've came in con who you have come into contact with. Um, that sort of technology has been around for a while and is not particularly innovative. This is just a new use case for it. So this is an example, Denise, of how the phone in our pocket or the smart device in our hand is actually a, a key to a more enabled future if it's managed correctly. And the reason I'm an optimist is you, you really do have a lot of things in life that are out of your control and you really do need the wisdom and the serenity to be able to choose the things that you can focus on and I'm particularly optimistic about technology and the way that it will enhance our recovery uh, and our next generation from and out of COVID as an era. Uh, and it will be a more technologically advanced era the next time we face a crisis such as this. Okay, I like the way you put it. It's very positive. So I, I kind of, uh, I think we need to work on that. Like like you said, this, uh, each of us has a, a, a role on this society. So Mike, it's been a real pleasure i think i could actually go at least for one hour more of more technical i think becomes too technical definitely will be more we'll put the links to your company i don't know if you want just as a last any any highlights you wanted to look at where we can actually find besides of course grab.com which you're going to put the link but any research or any articles from you or from the company because i think this is an area that everyone in the world should be looking more um not going to technical but at least understanding <laughs> and as well demystify like you said and i think in a good way or even especially cities and countries because i'm approached by a lot of them and they need that so if, i don't know if you want to just some links or some some you mentioned the united nations 2030 and the, the fact that there's a lot of research but there's a lot of more that we can actually do to to at least have a an effective role of demystifying and learning sure and you, you can search anytime for our group grabber technologies our our brand grabber.com is very easy to find. We have uh, many executives that are linked through our, our LinkedIn network as well. Uh, but what I would say is just, you know, Denise is having an open mind because when we have dialogue and engage with people and we find out what they, what they may need to integrate into their organization, um, if it's a commercial relationship, it may come down to price. It may be we're doing an RFP or an RFQ. We need the best barcode scanner that's under $200. Well, you know, someone once told me you can have fast and quick, but you can't have fast and quick in quality. And so if you want quality, when you're dealing with people's data and when you're dealing with sensitivity, you then have to choose between price and speed. Now, normally we, we achieve the balance of these things, but people need to, to understand that this technology is moving fast, but it may not be moving as fast as, as, as we'd like it to. So there's a perceived speed and then there's an actual speed. And um, I spoke recently on a fintech delegation that's trying to um, have a look at uh, searching for the best fintechs and bringing them into the MENA region uh, organized by the Abu Dhabi government. And I spoke to the fact that you need this adaptability, you need to live in the region. So I would suggest probably people that aren't technology professionals spend less time learning the technology, spend more time learning the culture, spend more time learning the privacy regulations, spend time learning whether or not these customers that you're targeting are actually useful and whether or not you can bring a benefit to them. We have a short time um, these days and, and with life being so unpredicted, we really need to spend it intentionally and on things that really matter. What a great way to end. Uh, thank you so much, Mike. It's been a, a huge pleasure and I think a lot of learning things that I think everyone needs to look for. Thank you so much.